Hello conscripts, I'm Commander Pruitt and this is General Jim Davis. We have the battle lines drawn here at Tribe Comics. The banners have been called, archers have knocked arrows. Infantry, prepare to receive charge for its big battles on WebDM. There's some rinky-dink encounters uh -huh, that the players uh -huh. can come into. They yeah. can have skirmishes and whatever, but when it comes to big-ass battles, right? Yes. What is your metric for gauging? When do you officially have a big battle? We're talking about war here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I, it involves at least, uh, to me, at least a thousand combatants on each side. Like, it's yeah. gotta be big. I've had large-scale encounters and fights where, you know, there's probably a couple of hundred, you know, individual yeah. combatants on the field. Although at a certain scale, whether it's a couple of hundred extra or a couple of thousand extra, the techniques you use are sort of like still the same yeah, uh, yeah. for managing those. For me, like a, a battle, something that qualifies as a battle has to, it involves like mass combat, armies of some kind, whether they're ad hoc arrangements of, of just like your warrior buddies that you call together or like professional soldiers that are recruited for a specific purpose. It's the coming together of them on a large scale that creates uh, a battle as opposed to like a raid or a, something smaller. Um, Right, right. Other than that, although in terms of just like military history overall or just sort of the course of warfare during medieval eras, the line between the two is very often mixed and yeah. blurred and you'll have like small scale skirmishes in the lead up to a fight or, or in between big battles, it's a lot of that. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a nebulous thing, but to me it's about scale and, yeah. and, and uh, the magnitude of the conflict that really, really defines like it's a battle. These momentous sides <laughs> crashing Actually, together. Uh -huh. This is going to happen. Sure, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what are the moving parts that a DM needs to keep in mind at mm -hmm. all times? That's the big challenge of these things. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is there's like a keeping lot going it all on. Moving. In terms of like military history, there's a large swath of history across both time and, and geography that we can say a lot of similar things about and sort of draw some conclusions from. Medieval combat in, in one part of the world looks awfully similar in, in roughly the same time and place, or not place, but at least the same time uh, as others. And so you can kind of like draw these conclusions from it. This is assuming that the forces at work in your world want a battle. Mm -hmm. uh, because occasionally battle happens when only one side wants the battle. That's usually called an ambush. <laughs> you know, the other side is not looking to fight. But in most cases during this time period, you know, this requires both armies like getting up, getting themselves in formation, marching themselves close enough to be a threat to the other army. You very rarely, what you see is like, that they come to, that they seek each other out and come together. That That's one style of military conflict where you like seek out a battle. Uh, but for a great deal of history, armies are so expensive and so difficult to keep in the field that you don't want to fight with these things. Like, <laughs> too like nice. this is too expensive. These guys <laughs> just got this armor. And so what you might have is say one army wanting to fight the other and the other retreating to a castle or fortress to, uh, and then having to endure a siege or one army like breaking up into a lot of small units and like raiding or, or uh, pillaging a countryside in order to you know draw an enemy out to fight um, yeah, yeah so there's a lot of different ways that you would actually get to a pitched battle but the pitched battle is iconic right it, it's that moment in fantasy literature whether we're talking about like the hobbit and, and battle of the five armies or the lord of the rings and the battles that are there it's like mm -hmm. big military battles which are kind of redundant are a part of the genre and so all of the stuff that like leads up to one is interesting and might be uh, you know part of the fabric of a campaign but like getting to this moment in a fight, um, or rather getting to this moment in a campaign is, uh, is complex, lots of moving parts like you were saying. You've got your armies, mm -hmm. they are, uh, they're willing to fight or they are in a mood to fight, uh, you know, for whatever reason. They walk up on the right side of the bed. There's a period before a, a, a large scale battle that's it's sort of a, a pr preliminary phase. Let's use an example. You are, uh, you know, you're part of a, a regular sort of army that's invading an enemy territory. And let's say you're semi-professional, something like the, an army from the Roman Republic uh, or something like that. Your commanders are mostly amateurs. You're probably like a farmer or something like that that's been uh, drawn up. But you have procedures in place that, that lend it an air of professionalism. You got a camp and, and the camp is uh, arranged according to a certain uh, pattern or something. So in this preliminary phase, perhaps you've got scouts coming in and out of the two camps of the armies trying to figure out where each other are. Maybe there's a spy in the camp that's feeding information to you know to the enemy or something like that. It's this preliminary phase in the days before a battle or the hours before a battle 
well where there's a lot of like small scale conflicts, a lot of like cavalry skirmishes as, as you know, groups of scouts and explorers and things like that come into conflict with each other. And as armies leave their camps and draw up for battle, you'll find that these skirmishes uh, occur more and more frequently. And in a lot of times, a small skirmish will escalate into a large battle because it's like, oh, our scouts encountered resistance here. We'll go send them some reinforcements and mm -hmm. help them out. And then the other side's like, oh crap, they really, <laughs> they, you know, they're sending like an advanced force against us. We need to stop that. Yeah, and, uh, and, and now you snowballs have, and snowballs. And, and now you have the battle of the sunken cost fallacy. Exactly. <laughs> right. And it, but it, it happens, right? It happens yeah. all the time throughout military history where people are drawn into fights and conflicts yeah. on accident. And like, no one was like, well, we didn't necessarily want to seek this out, but it, but it happened. Yeah. Uh, it's usually the commander that can recognize it's happening first and act swiftest that's going to be in the most advantageous place. But let's say that that's not the case. And that what really is, is that the two armies know roughly where each other are. They are willing to do battle and they're marching towards each other. That initial phase is going to feature uh, lots of skirmishing and scouting, usually by cavalry, but not always. Yeah. Uh, there's usually some kind of element of, of screening an advanced troop or, or something that arrives on the battlefield first and makes sure that where the their allied army, you know, allied soldiers want to deploy is, is sort of clear, that they're screened. Sometimes it's like a physical thing, like you're say a uh, you know, bunch of scouts on horseback are screening the advance and formation of the main army simply so that the enemy can't tell where's the strongest unit mm -hmm. going to be. You know, where are they deploying like in an oblique order so that most of their forces are weighted towards one of the two flanks of their army and they're gonna like hammer on that one and then the rest of them are just there to keep from being overwhelmed or are they gonna be like a full wave? So this initial phase here, there's a lot of like all right, we're gonna like, get up close to the enemy. What are they doing? How are they accomplishing it? Can we stop the enemy from doing that to us? That's all pre-battle stuff. Usually this is also where you'll get like mass archery or mass missile fire uh, in some way just to like keep the other uh, other side on their toes and harass them. That yeah, yeah, and draw out those actual lines because, you know, they can only shoot X far. Right, right, right. Move right up to that range. Yeah, it's a cat and mouse, right? Like you send your archers too far forward, well, the cavalry might charge and, mm -hmm. and provoke. And this is, again, how these battles start happening, like by happenstance and accident, is because it's like, oh, this group over here is being harassed by enemy fire from a group of skirmishers and they just can't take it anymore and they break ranks and, and rush forward to attack. Plenty of instances of things like that happening but let's say it doesn't and you've got the two sides skirmishing scouting their their, their main uh, forces have drawn up for battle they've got their formations their banners are out whatever it is they're doing and they now advance and uh, that advancement sometimes it, it occurs uh, according to like a specific order or something you might have the vanguard the position of honor the first to fight kind of uh, yeah. uh, warriors and they're at a per certain position in your army that you know signifies their importance and maybe they lead the fight Maybe it's sort of like we all go, you know, advance forward at once, or maybe it's sort of like a piecemeal as different units move forward and secure uh, different parts of the battlefield before coming into conflict with one another. But it's worth sort of dwelling on what the point of a battle is in the first place. You're there because uh, the enemy soldiers represent the, the enemy's resistance, its ability to hold off what you want from the enemy, mm -hmm. right? Like you go to war because you uh, have exhausted other possibilities or don't even want to try them and you want to force your opponent to do something, to engage in a certain course of action and, and, and change it. It's why the phrase uh, you know, war is just politics by other means yeah. comes up. Um, that's not always the case. Sometimes annihilation is the o objective, but very rarely, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Certainly before pre-industrial war, it's difficult to like, wipe people out. To, yeah, <laughs> to completely wipe people out of existence. Yeah, it takes you know? calories and muscle power. <laughs> to, uh, to do all of this. So you have other objectives, right? Like, is the point to move past the army because you, uh, there's something, they're standing in the way between you and something else, or vice versa. Maybe uh, you are trying to stop another army from, from doing that. Um, so it's worth thinking about what the point of the battle is, what are the objectives of the commanders, because that will determine what they do. It's very rare that like both sides advance and meet and charge. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it happens, but it's rare. A lot of times one side is just gonna sit somewhere and wait for the other side to come to them because they can afford to do that. As units sort of advance towards one another, you might get uh, more skirmishing that goes on. You might have people throwing, say, uh, shorter ranged uh, weapons like uh, javelins or something like that. Or if it's uh, Renaissance or pike and shot, this would be where you know, your sort of cloud of musketeer skirmishers sort of spread out from the pike formation and start harassing other pike formations as they, as they come closer to each other. But once you get stuck in with like infantry on infantry, that's when 
it becomes like a big slog. A lot yeah. of times with infantry, you're just like... <laughs> the porcupines are fighting now. <laughs> the porcupines are fighting, the two big blocks of people. Uh, this is where flank attacks become important, <laughs> right? <laughs> there are a bunch of Renaissance artists who would draw uh, pictures, like sketches of what war was like. And there's one of them like bad war. And it just is a mass of knives and pikes and there's no order. It's just like a giant scrum of people, a, a knot of soldiers just trying to kill each other and, and uh, or prevent them, more, probably more likely just prevent dying themselves. And so these things are, are nasty. We don't really know what they look like, but we do know that, that they were bad and could last a while uh, in some cases. But that's why you, that's why you really want your, your each side to have bright colors. Sure, right. Pop where against, they, where, where we're that contrast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, lost in that chaos. Yeah. You lost, know who to stab. You know who to stab, you know who your friends and allies are, yeah, that kind of thing. And, you, and there'll be lulls, right? You might fight for a little bit and then the, the two sides will break apart for a little bit. Or, or, Jim, I don't think combat should be a thing to laugh at. Oh, lulls, <laughs> yes. never mind. Lulls. Uh, yeah. uh, and there's a, uh, you know, that's where they start throwing stuff at each other again. Oh, maybe yeah. it's like you'll read about these accounts where two armies get like super close to each other and then it's a lot of yelling and fighting and backstabbing like they're throwing dirt claws uh -huh. and you know maybe throwing weapons at yeah. each other but yeah the big battle equivalent of just like squaring up like, what? say something say something say something you know <laughs> you're just doing that with like 10,000 men though you know? yeah basically and a, a battle will flow like that sometimes that's you know there'll be an intense uh, bout of fighting and then the two sides separate for a minute catch their breath switch uh, you know soldiers in and out these battles might take place over long periods of time hours but the actual fighting might just be minutes yeah you know a lot of this is maneuver getting into position right. uh, and so you've got this stalemate the two sides have come together it's they're they're you know come to grips it's pike versus pike shield swords all that kind of stuff and then it's uh cavalry who say initiate a charge in the flank or a surprise uh you know attack that you, that uh that really breaks things this is the moment where you realize that it's not killing the enemy soldiers that's important it's like breaking their will to fight Right, morale, <laughs> morale is, a is huge the most important thing. Deal. Logistics and morale are the most important things about warfare. Just mm -hmm. period. You know, it's not glamorous. It's not pretty. It's not the flashing swords yeah. and charging cavalry. Yeah, read the art of war. It's, you're right. It's, <laughs> most of the time, it's it's the land you're fighting on, yeah. and the leadership and the will to fight the on the will, other yeah. side. Yeah, and so you're trying to break the opponent's ability to fight. Now, imagine this situation. If you've ever been in a large crowd before, a concert or something like that, try to imagine what it's like to see ten or twenty people ahead of you. Now, imagine that you know ten or 20 people ahead of you are fighting for your life. There are knives, swords, spears, all kinds of things, deadly weapons. Your life is on the line, but you can't see shit. There's dust, blood, people screaming, all kinds of missile weapons flying about. It's hot. You're probably thirsty, hungry, nervous, afraid. You don't know what's going on ahead of you, but you start he, all you hear is the sounds of your companions dying, screaming, fighting. And that nervousness, that energy gets the better of you and yeah. you run away. You don't have an outlet, right? You don't have an outlet. And, and this is one of the reasons why I say the Romans put more officers at the rear of their formations mm -hmm. than they would the front. Or why um, you know certain formations of the Renaissance is the same thing. An officer has like a giant stick that keeps people in line. <laughs> But sometimes that's not enough, and a route, route usually occurs from the rear uh, of a unit backwards, and they'll flee. Sometimes they can be rallied, sometimes they can't. But this is a moment where they're incredibly vulnerable because the strength of infantry is in its formation. Cavalry can get amongst them and kill them. This is usually where you see the most kind of casualties. This bears out in archaeological evidence. They'll usually be like long trails. Usually the killing fields of these is sort of like a route. The route of the route. Yeah. Root of the route. The root of the route. <laughs> that's, you should write that right. adventure. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. I, you can totally see it, you know, as mm -hmm. they start to, he's just running them down one after the other. Prisoners get taken, uh, yeah. people are killed, there's casualties. What do you do with the wounded? Like after a battle, you know, post battlefield's pretty dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. People come out to pick through the dead, to take things, to take their spoils. That's just in the real world. You start throwing magic arms and armaments. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a whole different story. It's it's a whole different story. And, what does and that ransom look like for those nobles that yeah. you take? Yes, exactly. Are there magic items that need to be ransomed uh, and, and taken? Are there monsters that might be involved in any part of this, right? Like a battlefield is probably a terrifying place in a D&D world because you've got just a bunch of dead bodies. And think about all the things in D&D that just eat dead bodies. What a big battlefield like that would attract, you mm -hmm. know? Or what kind of casters are on the other side and maybe they want their they people to get them. routed. Mm -hmm. Because now guess what? Now they've got some, some, gonna some raise uh, them. zombies and skeletons. And you, you've depleted your resources while giving me the soldiers that mm -hmm. I actually wanted. That would be a great way for a necromancer to invade. Uh, well, when we think about it, the fact that they don't have morale, they don't need to eat. You know, we've, we've mentioned before about the 
strengths of the undead army yeah, yeah. <laughs> before. But so that's kind of a long-winded and, and maybe overly detailed way of, of kind of looking at the anatomy of a battle. And there's special cases, yeah. you know, sieges, night battles, raids, ritual combat, and dueling, even in the midst of war, are all features oh, of yeah. this, right? You know, right. Um, calling out two champions to do battle. That kind yeah, of thing. And there'll be probably a lull in that area. If sure, yeah, yeah. Form a ring, form around you know, it, yeah, uh, and start fighting, yeah. I'm just thinking of, uh, of the movie Hero. Heroes, where he one, goes out that, and he challenges the other side, and yeah. the troops actually they stop firing mm -hmm. on the thing just yeah. to, so he can fight the champion, <laughs> right? It's like that. Troy, I think, was another Troy one. Troy was a, wild, a, another a long great. time ago, yeah. Yeah. There's moments here where there's a chance to zoom in on the actions yeah. you see, but this is like the overall picture of what it looks like. So, um, in uh, amidst all that chaos, in whatever stage you're talking about, the pre skirmish, the big battle, the route, yeah. the whatever. So, how, how does a DM, amidst all that chaos, highlight the PCs? In a truly effective and very Star Warsian way, yeah. Because yeah, I think yeah. Star, to me, like that's the most iconic movie I can think of that pops around to multiple spots, right, right, in right. A, the same big battle, yes, right. So yeah. How do you give them that those moments? I've used a system for a while, and we'll we'll we can, we can talk about a more a bit more about the systems here in a minute. But what you're really looking for, and what all the systems I've used basically boil down to, is finding the iconic moments of a battle that you would like to see what the player's contribution is to that moment. And then if you want, you can sort of like use those moments as a gauge for their, their contribution to the battle overall and how they might swing it in their favor. You're looking for heroic moments, right? Moments where the party can, uh, or, or the players can like display some act of courage or bravery, that it's their intervention in something that uh, propels momentum forward. Maybe they lead a charge. Or you're looking for desperate moments, moments where if the players don't intervene, if, if, if something doesn't happen, this could go badly. It's only the timely intervention of a party member into the situation that keeps it from being a disaster. Yeah, the ranks are about to break, mm -hmm. about to come through, maybe a champion's there. Yeah. You know, the dragon, or the, uh, what is it, the king's egg, berserk, mm -hmm. yes. the golden, uh -huh. whatever. <laughs> like, I think that's a that's a couple of awesome moments, uh, yeah. just like that, where it's, oh, yeah. you know, Guts fighting the, the leader of the purple rhino knights, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. or fighting Gutsu, <laughs> yes. or whatever the, the, big, the big guy, they, anyway. <laughs> It's a great series. You should watch it. Yeah, <laughs> but it's but it's like it highlights it though, right? Like like the use of Star Wars and others, where you're you're wanting to zoom in those moments. So this is a very sort of like we're going to skim across the surface of a, of a lot of different types of encounters, but they can each be spun into uh, something. So in the pre-battle phase, right? There's all sorts of uh, raids on the enemy camp. You might raid an enemy camp to disrupt them, to shake their confidence, to uh, deplete their resources somehow. Maybe it's a distraction uh, of some kind. You hit their supply line. Hit their supply lines is another, right? Like raid their caravans, take their stuff, you know, deny them the ability to eat, the horses to, to put their cavalry on, uh, that kind of thing. Play out a scene where you're like a spy in the camp. You try to sneak in. Maybe it involves like killing a guard or, or something to take their uniform and then sneaking into the camp and, and trying to report back. These are moments for characters focused on stealth, subterfuge, things like that, that, that might not be as uh, valued once like the pitched battle starts. But here in the beginning, you can give those kind of characters a chance to shine by sneaking, and gathering information, things like that. Assassination, right? Like killing the general before just, the thing starts. I was just about to say, <laughs> sneaking into the camp, waiting for the lines to form, and you kill the general right at the beginning of the battle. Yeah. Right yeah. as the first orders are being sent out. Yeah. I mean, imagine what that would do to an army. Yeah, yeah, especially if you're talking about like an army that where the king is both head of state and head of the military and needs to lead and be seen being to lead, and their presence on the battlefield is amazing major component of why their army is fighting. Yeah. So if they're not there, that, that deals a, that's a way to kind of like short circuit the whole thing before it could even get started. Yeah, cut, cut off the head, <laughs> the snake will wither. Right? Yeah, exactly, I mean, exactly. You know, in that pre-battle phase of, of screening and skirmishing where, you know, maybe your character leads a unit of cavalry yeah. or other skirmishers that, that are there, they're advanced scouts. They're there to protect the army while it deploys. They're there to keep the enemy from doing the same, drive them off, learn as much as they can. It's dynamic, it's fast pace they're on they're mounted you know and so they're galloping or charging all across the place uh, it's, it's maybe dragging brush behind them putting mm -hmm, up a mm -hmm. literal screen yeah right like putting up smoke or, uh -huh. or, or dust or something like that uh, is another preparing the battlefield by digging holes or putting mm -hmm. in stakes or something like that is another uh, thing that these sorts of soldiers got up to once like the lines are drawn and everything is, is you know the armies are ready to fight yeah um, and we get into the dynasty warriors here. right yeah, well, that's kind of thing <laughs> it's right? a like, perfect <laughs> to me it's like the best <laughs> representation in like video games of like 
a hero sure. in this huge thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, are you playing that larger than life thing? That maybe the players are like leading these units, and yeah. they are the champions that are that are leading them into battle, or maybe they're the foot soldiers, and you're playing more of a, a down to earth, low powered kind of thing where it's just like survive this thing. Be a part of like say an initial cavalry charge as as an opening move, you know, designed to like shake the confidence or break through a weak point in the enemy line. Vice versa, you try to withstand that uh, thing. During this entire time, there's all sorts of missile fire that's going on. Arrows, slings, bolts, javelins, weirder weapons besides. There were, <laughs> there were uh, Germanic warriors that threw like these throwing axes that would bounce along the ground and like just the, kind of tumble they would kind of tumble in unpredictable ways and so it was like difficult to figure out where you should put your shield to block them or you know hey uh, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you even uh, even in a perfect world uh, an example it's not war but my father was playing softball one time mm -hmm. and just because of the ground the way it was he was just a, it was just a normal one hopper yeah and it hit just wrong it just like came right caught there. him right between the eyes yep. and it's just like <laughs> just purple Oof. you know now imagine a weapon of war yeah just meant for that mm -hmm. and uh, you know that's you're gonna have a bad time it's gonna be a bad time yeah so there's all kinds of missile fire flying about there's horses and other mounted soldiers charging all around you you're part of this like formation of infantry like maybe you're playing out a scene where the two sides meet for the first time and if they've got pole arms they're kind of keeping each other at arm's length but you've got a shorter weapon you can sneak in inside their guard and like get in amongst them or you fight their champion or something like that as it gets to sort of like the stalemate as the battle becomes more fevered you could have a moment where you're there to rally uh, faltering morale or vice versa you're you see that the morale of an enemy is, is faltering and, and you know you're there to play out a scene of like can you exploit that can yeah. you break their will to fight in this yeah, that, that last crashing wave <laughs> to break through the levees so yep. to speak yep what do you do if you're in command of a unit that's under a surprise attack and they thought that they were fighting this unit and they did not realize those people were right there you know until it's too late you got to adapt to that so these are all moments uh you know that you can play out do you play out trying to save as many soldiers as you can during a rout or try to play out a scene where you're like a light cavalry that's sent to pursue a routing enemy and they've rallied and have, have taken a second stand and you're not prepared for that and now it's now you're the one who's, who's running away yeah. like those are the kinds of dynamism and moments that you can focus in on see like all right what can the players do here to change the course of the battle and then like four or five of those moments particularly if you pick like a couple from pre-battle several more from during the battle itself then maybe fewer from post and link those together you can create kind of a coherent scene and then in between those you just sort of describe what's going on around them because they probably don't have a bird's eye view you don't have to describe that much uh, the wizard with his familiar will the wizard but is familiar with certainly that's where you're going to supply that right <laughs> that's where you can supply those descriptions though uh -huh. give a check in with that wizard yeah uh, which leads me to my next part like talking about these different moments like how does a fundamental thing like magic in fantasy. I mean, we have the real world examples that yeah. you're laying out, but yeah. magic can just change so, so many aspects of that. Right, right, you right. Know, do you have knots of units in a world where that opposing wizard can throw a fireball? I mean, it's that's a real question, right? Because right, so far we've been talking about a more down to earth, uh, you know, like a ga this would be appropriate for a Game of Thrones mm -hmm. style battle. Or like low it, magic. Low know? magic, that kind of thing. But is it appropriate for, say, Forgotten Realms or even Greyhawk or something like that? Let alone uh, worlds like Eberron, which uh, we know have featured magical like magical warfare on an industrial scale their units look very different worth talking about like why imagery gets into big blocks in the first place and that's because if they are able to maintain unit cohesion and discipline they are a formidable force and there's not a lot that will be able to break them yeah unless you like psych them out and they run mm -hmm. themselves that's yeah. Basically, what cavalry is trying to do, right? Like, right. Well, I mean, but as long as they stay together, <laughs> mm -hmm. cavalry can't really break them apart. They right. got their shields overhead for range. Uh -huh. They stay together against the cavalry and yep. just keep marching forward to maintain a foothold yeah. on the land. Yeah. So in our own world, once those formations became vulnerable, and they became vulnerable right around the time that you started getting mass firearms and artillery that could be present on the battlefield and not just like in a fixed location, they started thinning their lines. They would, <laughs> would go from like 16 ranks to eight to three eventually. And now they're forming like hollow squares where it's like a rank of three, but the bulk of the formation is is hollow. So it's like, yeah, a cannonball is gonna go through it, but it's at best gonna kill six people, right. not 12, yeah. whatever. So you might find that as well. You might find that, uh, you know, that they adopt these more linear formations where the fireball's damage is mitigated, uh, if not, you know, outright eliminated. Maybe they break up into loose order and keep some distance between everybody. Yeah, I was gonna say they have a call to just disperse. Disperse. 
course, they spread out 20 feet apart. Sure. Yeah. Fireballs are going to get like one or two of them. Right. Or you could sort of like do the opposite and, and say like they clump up and they do like the Tetsuo formation the Romans would have where they just like turtle up. Put your shields overhead, shields up front. The fireball might take out some people in the front, but they've all got cover from that attack. They, you can't like, you still need to see where to put it. So you can't like embed it deep in the ranks. You can only explode it either on top or in front of them. Like that's maybe one way they handle that. And they just try to push through. Maybe, especially if you're combining with magic, say they have a standard that protects them, that grants them some bonus to their save or grants them some kind of fire resistance or they've had a spell cast on them as a unit, which would necessitate a different kind of magic, but let's just kind of Go nuts here. Or, I mean, hell, like, they could have, they could have an abjure right in the heart of their ranks, they protecting be, them. Uh -huh, that's waiting to cast a, a, a you know a counter spell or to absorb uh, you know something. It's worth thinking about because yeah, why would they clump up in big units if there's a fireball? But we've answered that question in our own world when exploding weapons became a problem, and that they thinned out. They adopted other formations. The other part of it is social. A lot of times they were kept in formation is because you've got aristocratic officers, you know, commanding what they see as low lowlifes, that they can't trust them. They don't have courage. They don't have honor. Like, we have to keep them in this formation because what are you going to do, trust them to fight on their own? Like, are you an idiot? Uh, and it wasn't until the generals of our own world realized that, yeah, you can trust soldiers on their own if they're well-trained and well-disciplined, and guess what? That's super effective. And That's how that works. You actually give them cause to be loyal. Yes. Pay them well and mm -hmm. take care of them. Yeah. yeah. But if your soldiers are finding themselves on a battlefield that's thick with destructive magic, then why aren't they digging trenches for themselves? Yeah. Or using magic to create them, uh, and other sorts of field fortifications to protect them from that magic. Maybe your war, war in your world does not look at all like medieval war, and looks more like war in the 20th and 21st centuries with small units of highly trained professionals mm -hmm. engaging in, in you know kind of combat so it's it, it, like a DD party <laughs> right exactly <laughs> or maybe it's a combination of those things yeah, yeah. so it's it's not exactly like it doesn't have to be one way you don't have to have like it can be a mix and and you don't necessarily need to like agonize over you know what happens when the fireball shows up the other thing with that, and this is a long-winded answer, I know, but it's complex, is that maybe Fireball's not the best spell you could be casting right then. And maybe other magic, Clairvoyance, might be a better use of your first, or of your third level spell slot, or a Fly. Other sorts of magic might be better than just like a one-use Fireball. Yeah, knowing where the opposing general is keeping his ranks in reserve. Yeah. Where is their counterattack going to come from? Right, right, right. That's That would be far more valuable. Far more valuable. Than taking out those 20 dudes. Right, right, right. Not to mention all the magic that gets used before a battle to help the army move, to help them find where the enemy is, to help them get fed and healed up afterwards. So, yeah, big destructive magic is a feature of it, and I think it's like an important part of it, but just as much as things like summoning monstrous creatures to fight for you and, and you know, unleashing, um, you know, magic that conceals your movements. Fog Cloud uh, would be one that I, I'd see used a lot of battlefields, right? Just to help uh, oh, yeah. keep, keep, thing, keep your enemy from knowing what you're doing. So yeah, it's worth knowing what, what to do about the fireball, but probably the soldiers facing that fireball will, mm -hmm. will not stay clumped up for long. <laughs> okay. So we've gone through, we've established all the different parts you have to keep in mind. We've established a way to, to pop it on those highlights, considerations for magic and everything. But when it comes to the whole combat in, in general, yeah. what, are, what are some different ways that you have used different systems? Because yeah. there's many out there to, to keep track of all of that. I, I've used for a long time a system that I picked up from Warhammer uh, Fantasy Roleplay. And it was a system that was developed for the second edition of that game. And uh, it's called Tides of War. And you can still find it. It's a, usually freely available online. And it's basically a, a system of nested tables and procedures that get you to one of those heroic or desperate moments. And so it goes into great detail about what unit types are, you know, what types of units would be engaged in which part of the battle. It has a conceptual space for figuring out where you are in the battle. Are you in the front line? Are you in the reserve? Are you in camp? Yeah. Or that kind of thing. And then using all of those procedures to basically roll on a series of tables that will then tell you, okay, we're gonna fight out a scene where your character has to pick up the standard or they notice it fall, what they what they do is up to the scene that we do. Yeah. And then of, of tallying up kind of the, the scores from that to figure out how the battle has gone. I've used that system like as is, to the letter every time, uh, and I've used it also as just inspiration. Mostly now I just use the uh, examples of the kind of moments that you could get to. 
uh, to fight as opposed to like the procedures before it. But if you're looking for like a, a system that has solid rules, you'd, you'd need to convert it to something other than Warhammer because Warhammer does have a specific skill for tactics. You can play a character who has, you know, academic knowledge, strategy, and tactics that represents their knowledge of it. Like in D&D, you might have that be hand wave it as a history. You could create another knowledge skill for it. You could just sort of say like it's a part of a background, yeah. you know, soldier background certainly would have it, possibly noble. So that's one way of doing it. And, and it's a very crunchy uh, sort of subsystem for Warhammer. It's delivered some really like iconic moments in gaming. I've, I've used it for, for several big battles that we've run over the years, and it's always pretty satisfying. I mean, you, I continue to want you as my DM, so mm -hmm. there you I go. would concur with that. I'll take that, I'll yeah. take it. Uh, the next one that I've, that I've found is one I've only used more recently, and that's Matt Colville's uh, Strongholds and Followers. There are some uh, open game license uh, rules for warfare in there and I used it for um, a big battle that I recently had in Land Between Two Rivers. There's two different ways of doing that. You sort of make units that have their own stat cards and you can have them fight sort of like unit by unit going and attacking, or you can like calculate up the totals of your army and use an equation to sort of figure out uh, who would win and by what margin and the like. And I used that second method uh, from Strongholds and Followers uh, to, to calculate this battle. It took me maybe 30 minutes to work through the equation, some division, some, uh, you know, some subtraction, that kind of thing, basic arithmetic. And then it produced a satisfying outcome because like I had, I had already said the battle generally progressed a certain way. And when I factored in like all of the strategic advantages that one side had versus the other, even though the other side had more uh, men and, and soldiers in it, it created this satisfying thing where like the first round of that fight was a stalemate and was like a, well, yeah, I, I kind of thought it would be a stalemate when I narrated that scene in, in, in the battle uh, when we actually played and then like having it occur organically through the use of this uh, system was really satisfying and then like I rolled for a, a second round of that fight and it ended up with a complete and utter route uh, of the side that I thought would have routed that I predicted would have. So it's like I found it really satisfying to use and it produced a result that I found was uh, had a high degree of fidelity to what I understand about military history. Really interesting to use. Um, I'm curious to see where they go for it with other books, uh, that system. Um, the other one, third one, I just mob rules from the DMG, page 250. It'll tell you, that's that Dynasty Warriors. You want to get that Dynasty Warriors feel where you roll up in there with your badass barbarian and just like lay waste to entire ranks of, yeah. of enemy soldiers. Uh, mob rules are, are a good way to, uh, to yeah. simulate that. You want, you want to look like Hela atta yeah. attacking, yeah. <laughs> attacking Asgard, right. just taking out whole swaths uh -huh. of people. <laughs> um, and it'll produce that kind of uh, game, you know? Yeah, yeah. It, and it's fun, and I think it fits with D&D rather nicely, particularly like high-level D&D, because you are dealing with people who have like almost superhuman powers uh, yeah. then, so it's, it's handy. I would use Sly Flourish's mob uh, hit calculator, and it sort of like lets you know, um, so you don't have to do a bunch of die rolls, how many of this mob hit. Mostly it's to cut down on a bunch of D20 rolls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I just kind of uh, hand wave something. Like, I have, I have yet to do like a really big battle, just kind of bigger skirmishes. Uh -huh. And when it's a big group like that, I usually, however many people are in the skirmish is kind of a bonus that I give to the die roll. Yeah. So as you take people down, they get less of a bonus. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So it's like one hit, well yeah, you take this much from all the arrows. Yeah. And eventually it's like, well, now there's only like three of them, and so they're not really hitting. Right, 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 yeah. I, I've used it before where it's like, I think the last time I used the mob rules was like two PCs versus 250 angry villagers. And these were like wasteland, Mad Max style wasteland villagers too. So they're not like, you know, dirt farm of peasants. One of the players had killed their leader. They wanted to escape quickly. I was like, it's gonna take you five rounds of doing nothing but moving to get out of the village to escape. That's five rounds that these mobs have to attack you. And, and I almost, I mean, if it hadn't been for stone skin, I would have gotten them. Anyway, oh. <laughs> so it, 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 it's an abstraction. It's, uh, you're gonna wanna, you know, yeah. massage that abstraction and, and make it palatable through your descriptions. Um, but then the, the fourth system that I've used is to just hand wave it, to just focus in and, and run this, this focused thing like a regular D&D combat and everything else around them is just flavor. I don't, I'm not use a system, I don't wanna do anything else. It's just like, hey, yeah, the, the players are gonna stick together in the battle. They're gonna be in this part of it. Let's just like run a combat maybe with waves or something like that. And we're not even gonna worry about mechanical support for any of this other stuff. We're just gonna present this big battle and then use narration to sort of uh, highlight the fact that it's a, a big pitched battle. So that'd right. be kind of the fourth one. Right, right. <laughs> so um, any closing thoughts you'd like to ransom off to our, uh, wow. to our, our, our our viewers out there. Yeah, I mean, big mass combat's not for every campaign. 
but it, it it's if it comes up organically if it comes up as a consequence of like you know the, what your players are up to and the, the, the events they've set in motion then you might find yourself like yeah I, I need to run like a big fight <laughs> there's a war going on in the background of my campaign and, and it's come to the to the player's doorstep and yeah. so you might not find that you use it all the time but particularly for Dungeons and Dragons and especially as you get higher level in Dungeons and Dragons I find that the potential for war and the potential for like mass combat increases because you're dealing with a scale at which that then becomes possible Right. By the time you in the tier three, tier four, you might command armies yourself, you know, or, or be in a position to command them. You know, if you find yourself wanting to run a mass battle, just like picking a system, working through it, figuring out what you want out of the encounter uh, is going to be a place to start. And then hopefully we've uh, offered you some suggestions to have a satisfying big fight. Yeah, and maybe the players will be the ones to end it. Right. <laughs> Head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. WebDM is also on Twitch with three weekly games, which we upload to WebDM Plays, our second YouTube channel. Big battles. Mass combat. The big ones. Big, ones. big natural battles. Big ones. Big battles. Big bats. Cool. <laughs> Bat those biggins around. <laughs>